matter. As we start to talk about chemistry, it's important to consider what chemistry actually is. In other words, when you take a class entitled chemistry, what are you actually going to study during that class? Most scientists agree that chemistry, in general, is the study of what we call matter. Now, matter is a technical term, but in reality, matter refers to most of the stuff that's around you. In fact, some people would say that the word matter is just a technical word that means stuff. That is a little bit of a simplification because in order for something to be considered to be matter, it has to meet two qualifications. The first qualification is that all matter always has mass. And the way we measure mass is usually by weighing something. Most of the time we think about an object's mass and its weight as being the same thing. In reality, this isn't always true because you, for instance, have a certain mass that caused you to weigh something here on Earth, but if you were to travel to the moon, you would have the same mass but a different weight because the gravity changes on the moon. Because most of the science that you're going to worry about in this course has to do with the science here on Earth, we'll just consider mass and weight to be roughly the same thing. So, for a substance to be considered matter, it has to first weigh something, or have mass. The second qualification for a substance or an object to be considered matter is it has to have volume. Volume is the amount of space that something takes up. So, anything around you that has a weight and takes up some space can be considered matter. It's important to realize that even though there are many things around you, visible things like the pen or pencil that's in your hand right now or the computer that's in front of you, even though they have very measurable m amounts of mass and they obviously take up space, even very, very small and very, very large objects also have mass and volume. So just because you can't necessarily see something with the naked eye, doesn't mean it doesn't have some mass. It just has a very small mass and probably takes up a very small volume. In fact, when we think about the different objects and substances around us, most of them should qualify to be matter. Let's look at some examples. For instance, many people take this course because they're interested in going into health sciences, different medical fields. So for a lot of people who take this course, the type of chemistry they're most interested in is the chemistry of the matter that's in the human body. You can think about your entire human body as being matter, or you can think about the different parts of it as being matter. Your cardiovascular system, that takes up space and it weighs something, so that makes it matter. If you're not interested in the human body, you might be interested in other bodies, maybe a puppy or maybe you're interested in other types of biological entities like, you know, fish and sea life. Whether you're talking about the human body, a puppy, a fish, or anything else that's a living thing, it will take up some space and be made of stuff that gives it weight, which means these are all types of matter, and they're all things we can study using chemistry. Not only can we study the way they are, we can use chemistry to diagnose, image, and have a better understanding of them, and we can use chemistry to deal with matter that goes into and changes the human body. So pharmaceuticals and prescriptions that you put into the human body also constitute matter, and therefore they are things that you can study in chemistry. All living things, whether animal or whether plants, consist of matter because they're all made up of things that have mass and take up space or have volume. So that means not only do we study things like animals and plants, a lot of plants and animals end up being food. So food chemistry, or the study of things that we eat, very much is a study that comes out of the study of matter or chemistry. There's a lot of other things also that come from the earth that may constitute matter. You may not think about it all the time, but many things that come out of the earth, whether it's oil, mineral, gemstones, these all take up space, they all have volume, and they all weigh something or have mass. So these are all things that you can study in chemistry. The geological resources, whether they're petroleum, natural gas, or solar or wind energy, these all constitute things that are made up of matter and therefore we can study using chemistry.
In fact, virtually everything around you is made up of materials that take up space and have some weight. So in the end, building materials, the human body, the food we eat, the energy we around us and where it comes from, a lot of these end up being things we can study through chemistry. In other words, they're all matter, it's all stuff, so it's all things chemists study. And in fact, while chemistry itself may or may not actually interest you, when we start to look at the nuances of chemistry or the different fields that chemists study, there's virtually always something you might be interested in. If you're interested in living things, you might actually be interested in biochemistry. If you're interested in things that grow and things that we eat, you might be interested in agriculture or, or agrochemistry or environmental chemistry, the chemistry of the environment around us, whether it's plants, whether it's the air around us. And air is actually a good example to mention. Even though we can't really see the air directly, we know that it has some amount of weight because that's why we experience things like air pressure and we know it takes up space. That's why you can use air to blow up a balloon. So air is a good example of a substance that is matter even though you might not think about it every day in your day to day life. Stuff that comes out of the ground, like geolo geological molecules, geological chemistry, and also what we use them for and how we manipulate them can be studied through materials chemistry. So these are all different types of chemistry and really it's one of the reasons that many people go into chemistry classes with a vague sense of what they're going to study, but a lot of people actually find something that they were already interested in that can be studied through chemistry. So with all these different types of matter that are out there, from living things to things that are around you or things that are manufactured, things that come out of the ground, even though they're all matter, that would be a lot of stuff to study in just one course. And for that reason, we're going to mostly restrict our examples to those that will affect the health sciences. So examples of things around us that really affect the human body and other living things. When we think about all the matter that's around us, it's important to realize that there's different ways we describe that matter. Scientists know that we can observe and describe matter in two different ways, or using two different forms of description. The first form is what's called qualitative descriptions of matter. The word qualitative might think, make you think of a word like quality. You're basically describing the qualities in an object, and I'll give you an example in a minute. The other type of form or other description that we use when we describe matter is called a quantitative description. The word quantitative might make you think of quantity. In other words, it's how we measure, count, or use numbers to describe things. Now in health science, a very classic example is you might be given a patient's urine specimen or a urine sample, and you might have to describe that as you're making a record for the patient. A qualitative description of a urine sample are things or qualities, or in other words, descriptions you can get just by looking and describing that sample. As you look at that sample in the middle of the page right now, some of the words that might come to mind from it are things like, it's a liquid, or it looks yellow. You might notice that it looks translucent, or if you're really brave, you might even sample and discover that hopefully it's relatively odorless. These are all qualitative descriptions. They describe the qualities of that substance, the qualities of that matter, that you can tell just by looking or feeling or just having a general sense and a general description of that matter. Quantitative descriptions, on the other hand, involve taking measurements. So while you can look at a patient's urine sample and come up with qualitative measurements, if you need to measure the sample, you're doing quantitative descriptions. Some examples of quantitative measurements might be if you take the weight of that sample. If we were to weigh the sample, maybe we'd find out it weighs 45 grams. Perhaps you measured the volume or the amount of space the sample takes up and discovered it weighs, or pardon me, it discovers that it takes up 41 milliliters. You might even measure the density or how much mass and how much space that sample takes up and find out it's something like 1.1 grams per milliliter. And finally, you might even just take the temperature of it and say that it, weighs, it has a temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice that these all use numbers or numeric values. These are quantitative descriptions because they involve 
measurements. They involve quantifying our observations and quantifying the descriptions of what we have. When it comes to describing different types of matter, one of the first things people often notice about matter is what its physical state is. Now physical states can be called physical states, sometimes they're also called phases of matter. So you might say that you're looking at a matter's physical state or its phase, and for us it's going to mean the same thing. These physical states simply describe the physical appearance and behavior of matter, and you're probably going to recognize the three most common phases of matter because they're th words that we use in our everyday life all the time. The three most common physical states of matter are solid state, the liquid state, and the gas or gaseous state. So solids, liquids, and gases are the three physical states of matter that we're most likely to run into in our day-to-day -day lives, and they're what we'll focus on for now. Just so you know, there are other physical states out there, some things that you might run into in certain circumstances and others that you're unlikely to ever see. For instance, plasma is a special type of physical state that sometimes exists in things like neon lights, but aside from that, you're very unlikely to run into it any, in your day-to-day -day life. There's a very rare kind called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is fascinating, but a little bit beyond the scope of this course. So let's look in a little more detail at solids, liquids, and gases. You already know or have a general sense of what it means to say that something is a solid or a liquid or a gas. But as a chemist, or as when we think like a chemist, we usually think about it on a much smaller scale. We usually think about the individual pieces that make up that substance. Let's start by thinking of a solid substance. A really good example of a solid substance, because it's something you have very, probably a lot of experience with, is ice. In other words, frozen water. Ice is a solid. And when we think about what makes it a solid, that word means something to you, but you might not realize it actually has a pretty technical definition. In fact, if we could zoom in on the solid ice, go past the level that you can see with the naked eye and zoom in until we could see the individual pieces that make up that solid, we call those pieces molecules. And as you probably already know, in ice, the molecule is H2O, same thing that makes up water. Well, in a solid, whether it's H2O in ice, or whether we're talking about a solid that makes up the table that you're writing on, or a solid that makes up the door to your room, all solids, what they have in common is that the molecules are basically locked in position and they can't move very much. Now in a solid, unless it's at a very, very cold temperature, and we mean much colder than something that we would see existing outside in winter, all solids are vibrating a little bit, but the molecules can't move very far from where they are. And in fact, that's why if you take a piece of ice, as long as you keep it below the freezing temperature of that ice, it'll keep the same shape that it always has. That's partly because there's really not a lot of motion to the molecules. Those little individual pieces or molecules of the ice are stuck in position and they can just vibrate there, but they can't move very far. The result of this is all solids, again, whether it's ice, whether it's the table in front of you or the door you walk through to your room, have a defined shape, meaning once they have that shape, they can't change as long as they stay solid. They also have a defined volume. They take up a certain amount of space and that won't change on its own. Now solids are things that we think of around us as being very unchanging. Let's compare that to the physical state of liquid. Again, to use an example we're all familiar with, think about liquid water, liquid H2O. That liquid water is a lot more variable in the way it behaves than a solid. If we could look at liquid water on a molecular level, we would see that the molecules can move around quite a bit. One of the results of this is that they can change shape. So in liquid water, or any liquid, whether we're talking about liquids within the human body, liquids in the environment, or liquids in a laboratory, all of those liquids have a greater degree of molecular motion, or a greater degree of movement, than the solids. The result of that is because the molecules can move around, they can change shape. 
This should remind you of your common everyday experience with water. Your water can flow through a tap into a bottle and you can pour it out into a glass and each time it just changes shape to fit the shape of the container you pour it into. This is true of all liquids. They have a variable or changeable shape. What you can't change in liquid, however, is its volume. For instance, if I have a gallon of milk, that milk can be poured out into glasses and change shape, but I'll need a gallon of space to take all the milk out of that gallon container. So they still have a defined volume. You can change their shape, but you can't change the amount of space that they take up. Let's compare this to our final common physical state, which is the gas physical state. To think about a common gas around you, there's a lot of examples, but just to be consistent, let's think about H2O, or liquid water, after it has boiled to become steam. Now, if we could see that steam at a molecular level, as you might anticipate, we would see the molecules moving around a lot. Basically, they can float freely in the air around you. In fact, we probably wouldn't see more than one or two molecules at a time because they do get very, very spread out. That's one of the reasons that you can see the screen in front of you right now. If you were underwater, it would be a lot more difficult for your eyes to see through the liquid to the screen. And if we put a solid door in between you and the screen, again, it would be very difficult. But gas tends to be so spread out that it's relatively easy for us to see through. Now, the molecules that make up gas tend to be in constant, very, very dramatic motion. They have much more molecular motion than a liquid and much, much more molecular motion than a solid. As a result of this motion, they can change shape easily, so they can fit the shape of a container like your lungs, and then you can exhale the gas in your lungs into a balloon and it takes up that space. It also has a variable volume. This is interesting because what this means is I can take a gas, maybe the gas from my lungs, and I can condense it down or compress it. This is why we're able to store gases in very high pressure containers because we condense the gas so that the same number of molecules or the same mass of gas fits into a smaller space. We can't really condense liquids or solids because they have a very defined volume. Keep in mind that even though we've used H2O as an example of the different phys <coughs> Keep in mind that even though I used H2O, or water freezing and water boiling, for the past few examples, these physical states apply to every type of matter that's out there. In other words, if you can come up with an example of matter, we can change its physical state simply by changing its temperature. With water, it's easy for us to imagine solid ice, liquid water, and steam because we're very familiar with them because they all exist around temperatures that we can accomplish just by using things in our kitchen to cool things down and heat them up. But even when we talk about other substances than H2O, physical states can be changed just by adding and removing heat. Let's take an example like iron. When I say the word iron, which we'll later learn is actually an element that has the symbol Fe, you probably right away are picturing a solid, probably a shiny gray metal. That's because it's the most common way we see it at room temperature. But you can heat up solid iron, and you may have seen this before, if you heat it enough, you get molten or liquid iron. All of the statements we made about H2O in solid, liquid, and gas form also apply to iron. Solid iron has molecules that are relatively close together, and they're not moving very much. If we heat it up to become a liquid, the molecules start to move more, and now its shape can change, but its volume won't. In fact, if we continue to heat it, you can actually take liquid iron and heat it up until it becomes a gas. Of course, this is very rare, very hard to do, so there's not really a photo of it, but it is possible. Let's look at another example. Think about the oxygen that you're breathing. The oxygen that you're breathing right now is part of air, and air, as you know, is a gas. It's not a solid or a liquid. So oxygen itself, the way we normally experience it, is just a gas that's around us all the time. There's a lot of other gases that are present in the air we breathe too, but we'll just think about oxygen for right now.
the oxygen that you're breathing is actually made up of two pieces or two atoms of oxygen bonded together, which is something we'll study later in this course. That oxygen is a gas, so it can change shape as it goes from your lungs to a balloon or maybe into an oxygen canister, and it also has a variable volume. You could condense the oxygen down into a very small canister, or you can let it out so that it spreads out into the room around you. If you cool down oxygen to a very, very cold temperature, you can actually turn oxygen into a liquid. Now we don't normally think about liquid oxygen unless you've seen it in a laboratory or a medical setting because it has to go to very cold temperatures until that happens, but it is possible. And for that matter, if you cool it down even further, you can get solid oxygen, although it's pretty hard for that to happen so we don't have a picture of it. All I want you to do is keep in mind that when we say solid, liquid, or gas, even though we tend to associate just one or maybe two of those physical states with each substance based on our common experiences, it is possible to change the physical state of any matter by adding and removing heat. When a substance changes from one physical state to another, for instance, if I have liquid water and I heat it up until it becomes a gas, we say that a physical change has occurred because all we did is we physically changed that substance from one state to another. We haven't changed the chemicals that are involved. H2O when it's a liquid is still H2O when it's a gas. We've just changed how the molecules are behaving. So physical changes refer to changing a substance from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or in any other direction or any other combination. Let's just briefly talk about some of the vocabulary or some of the words that you're likely to hear when people talk about physical change. Physical change refers to changing between these different physical states. And these physical changes or phase changes sometimes are things you're going to be familiar with, other times they may not be. When you think about taking something like solid ice and changing it into liquid water, we know that you can do that very simply by heating up the ice. In fact, just leaving ice on your countertop gives it enough heat to heat it up to a temperature at which it becomes liquid water. All physical changes, all phase changes, either require you to put heat in or take heat out in order to make them happen. In other words, I can take solid ice and heat it up to make it liquid water, or I can take liquid water and cool it down to make it solid ice. We usually think about these in terms of heat, but scientists often prefer to use the term energy. In other words, you have to take a solid and put energy into it to turn it into a liquid, whereas you take a liquid and remove the energy from it to cool it down and turn it into a solid. Some of these phase changes or physical changes are really familiar to you. The change between a solid and liquid is no surprise that we call it melting. And in fact, we often refer to the melting point, or the temperature at which a substance melts. Now solid ice, for instance, melts into liquid water at about 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0 degrees Celsius. That's something we'll talk about more later in the course. If you take the liquid water and you want to turn it into a gas, we say that you vaporize it or more commonly you might refer to this as boiling. So often people talk about the boiling point of water. And again, you can talk about the boiling point of any substance, the boiling point of iron, the boiling point of oxygen, or any other substance around you. If we're thinking about removing energy, some of the different changes we see are you can take a gas and condense it back down to a liquid. With H2O, you might have steam, and if you let the steam perhaps make contact with a cold window, we've all seen the water condense on our cold windows in winter. That's because they're having energy removed from it, or the molecules are having energy removed from them to turn them into liquid. And liquids, of course, can freeze, remove even more energy, or cool them down further to become a solid. Now even though those are very common terms, and you're probably familiar with all of them, there's also something else that can happen. In very specific circumstances, which tend to only happen with very specific substances, you can get something called sublimation. Sublimation is when a solid, when a heat is applied to it, changes directly to a gas. 
In other words, instead of a solid melting to become a liquid, then boiling to become a gas, the solid sublimates directly to a gas. It goes from being a solid directly to turning into molecules, usually in the air around you. An example of this is dry ice. Dry ice is actually solid carbon dioxide, solid CO2 molecules. When you take dry ice and you expose it to the air around you, it doesn't melt and turn into liquid carbon dioxide, it actually vaporizes and turns into a gas. Solid um, carbon dioxide or dry ice is often used in Halloween decorations because it starts out as a solid piece of ice and instantly turns into this spooky steam looking substance which is really just a gas. So sublimation is an example of a phase change that doesn't follow this normal course of solid to liquid and liquid to gas. It simply implies the solid goes directly to the gas. And probably the most common example of that is solid carbon dioxide. Now there's one more thing I want to mention about physical changes, and that's that, honestly, they're usually not very interesting. Physical changes, as you now know more than well enough, involve melting things, boiling things, vaporizing them. It's really just about changing temperatures and watching how molecules change in response. When we think, again, for the last time about the example of liquid water being heated up to become gaseous H2O or steam, we're talking about a physical change. But notice that all that changes is the physical states that are involved. H2O when it's liquid is made up of H2O and H2O when it's gas is still made up of H2O. In other words, they have the same chemical or the same matter just in a different physical state. What's much more interesting to most chemists, and what you'll probably find much more interesting during this course, is what we call chemical changes. These are changes where the physical state really doesn't matter. It might change, it might stay the same, but the chemical substance, or the matter itself, is what changes. In a chemical change, you might start with something like liquid water, which is H2O, and cause something to happen, either by heating it, reacting it with other chemicals, running electricity through it. You might get an explosion, you might see light, you might hear a noise. All sorts of interesting things can happen. And in the end, you get something that's completely different as far as the matter that's involved. For instance, H2O, if you do exactly the right things in the lab, can be changed into H2O2 better known as hydrogen peroxide. Now you'll notice here, even if you have no level of comfort with chemistry, chemical formulas, and these little letters and numbers that are appearing on the screen, notice that what we've done is changed the matter from H2O to H2O2. The liquid state changed, actually stayed the same, but again it might stay the same, it might change. What's important is we've actually changed the very nature of the matter. We've changed what it actually is. And that tends to be a lot more interesting. Let me give you another example. When we deal with chemical changes, the matter that we start with and the matter that we end with is chemically different from each other. In other words, if we could see it down at a very, very tiny level, we'd see that what it's made of is different at the start and different at the end. The physical state itself might change or it might not. It's really not important to determining whether a chemical change can happen. Now you probably don't know the chemical formula or the actual makeup of the matter around you for every single thing that's around you. H2O is something that we're very familiar with, but you may not know that hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, nor would I expect you to. So instead, we often notice that in chemical changes, even if you don't know what the actual chemicals are or what's actually happening at the very, very small molecular level, there's some common indications that you can look for. It's very likely that a chemical change has occurred if a substance changes color. For instance, if you take a piece of colored paper and you leave it outside in the sun, you might notice that it fades. That color change means that you've actually got different chemicals at the end of the time that that paper was left in the sun than you started with at the beginning. So color changes are a good example of a chemical change instead of a physical change.
Bubbles forming is another good example of a chemical change. If you've ever mixed baking soda and vinegar together to make the quote-unquote baking soda volcano, those bubbles are actually carbon dioxide and they're an indication that the chemicals are changing. It's not about the physical state, but the chemicals themselves. Also, when things change smell or taste or you can feel them changing temperature, these are all indications of, of chemical change. So if you take a delicious piece of smoked salmon and you leave it sitting out too long and it starts to smell bad, that's a good example of a chemical change. The chemicals within that fish have actually changed. There's some really classic examples of chemical changes that you run into in your everyday life and cooking is a really good one. Now because you don't know the chemical formulas or the actual matter and makeup of that matter and everything around you, one way to test what you're doing to see if it might be a physical change or a chemical change is to think about how easy it is to reverse. So think about cooking. If I take an egg and I crack it into a hot saucepan, that egg begins to cook. Now we might notice that it's started out kind of liquid and it's becoming kind of solid, and we don't know what the actual molecules or actual chemicals involved are. We might know there's some fats and protein and things like that. But what a really good indication is, is if you take an egg and you heat it up and it cooks, something has changed chemically. And a good indication of that is if you take the egg and you cool it back down, it's not going to change back into a raw egg. So that's one way that often indicates that a chemical change has happened. Think about if you cook a steak on your barbecue. The steak starts out red, it changes to deep dark brown or pink or black depending on how you like your steak on your barbecue. Those color changes indicate a chemical change, but also if you were to cool the steak down, you just get cold steak. It doesn't turn back into raw meat. So chemical changes often can't be reversed the way that physical changes can. If I take water and I heat it up, it turns into steam, but I can cool the steam down and change it right back into liquid water. Cooking, combustion, which is often just examples of burning are a good example. If I take a log in the fireplace and I heat it up, it's going to change in a lot of different ways, but it's all examples of chemical change because when I'm done, I have heat that's been given off, I have soot, I have ash, I have carbon dioxide that was generated during that process, and I can't take these things and just cool them back down and remake the log. And another example is anything that rusts. So a car that rusts, or a more technical word is oxidizes, those are reactions that are very hard to reverse and they are definitely examples of chemical changes. So physical changes always involve a substance changing physical state, but the matter itself doesn't change. H2O as a liquid is still H2O as a gas or as a solid. Chemical changes, on the other hand, take a type of matter and change it fundamentally. Change it so that you have an actual different type of matter when it's done. And examples of those are cooking, combustion, rusting, or anything where you see color changes, bubble forming, or any of these other indications that something has happened.